A very warm welcome to LSE and a warm welcome from the Department of Law in particular. My name's Jo Braithwaite. I'm an associate professor in the Law Department and it's a great honour to be chairing tonight's event. A couple of housekeeping points before we start on the good stuff. Um, please could you make sure mobiles and other devices are turned off please and don't disturb and don't make a noise. We're being recorded both audio and video in true Department of Law style. There'll be a podcast available subject to force majeure. <laughs> so we should have a video and podcast subject to all of that working properly. The format for this evening is, after a very brief introduction from me, you'll be hearing from four expert LSE speakers. And then we'll open up for a Q&A with a view finishing promptly at 8 o'clock. So a warm welcome then to our event, Cash, the Future of Money in the Bitcoin Age. You don't need me to tell you that this is an incredible, incredibly topical subject. You just have to open a newspaper and see daily stories this week about the price and about the volatility of Bitcoin. You also may have looked at today's Bank of England 2017 stress test of the UK banking system and seen there one of the scenarios factoring in the impact of fintech. So the subject more broadly is incredibly topical. For those of you who are brand new to the subject, uh, there are a couple of good sources I thought I would just quickly mention for you uh, if you wanted to read in, in addition, of course, to the weighty publications by our expert panel. Virtual currencies and the taxonomy and some definitions are usefully set out in a 2014 paper by the Financial Action Task Force. And they define virtual currency as a digital representation of value that can be digitally traded and functions as a medium of exchange and or unit of account and or store of value, but does not have legal tender status in any jurisdiction, is not issued nor guaranteed by any jurisdiction, and fulfills the above functions only by agreement within a community of users. So that's virtual currency. Tonight, you'll also hear mention of DLT, or distributed ledger technology, usefully defined in a 2016 paper by the UK government's chief scientific advisor as an asset database that can be shared across a network of multiple sites, geographies, or institutions where, whereby all participants have their own identical copy of the ledger. You'll also tonight hear talk of FMI, or financial market infrastructures, which in the UK are supervised by the Bank of England and include central counterparties, payment uh, systems, and security settlement systems. So that's some terms up front for those of you brand new to the topic. So we know it's topical, we know it's innovative, we know it's complex, and we know it's very ripe for scholarly analysis. So we've got four fantastic LSE speakers to do just that. In order of appearance tonight, we've got uh, Philip Pesch from the Department of Law, Assistant Professor of Financial Law and Financial Regulation, Director of the LSE Financial Market Law Project, and a distinguished career before LSE, including at the European Commission. We have Dr. Eva Michela, Associate Professor and Reader in Law at LSE, a member of the Management Committee of the LSE Systemic Risk Center. She's advised the UK government and she's a member of the Investor Protection and Intermediate Intermediaries Standing Committee at ESMA. We have Professor Nigel Dodd, a professor in the sociology department at LSE. He's the author of several books, many articles on the socio sociology of money, including 2014's Social Life of Money. He's got a distinguished record of scholarly achievement and publications and of public engagement, including on the BBC World Service, where he's broadcast on the 2007 to 9 financial crisis. And we also have Dr. Tatiana Cutts, Assistant Professor of Law, LSE, who prior to joining LSE was a senior lecturer at Oxford. She researches broadly on private law and policy, including in the area of Bitcoin and DLT. She's recently become an academic fellow of the Society uh, of Inner Temple. So you have four fantastic LSE experts to kick off. The format will be uh, 10 to 15 minute presentations by each of our experts. We will then 
have a Q&A session, uh, and I'll mention a few sort of housekeeping points about that before we start. Okay, so another warm welcome. Thank you, and I'll hand over to Philip. Thank you very much. Uh, what about the sound? Can everybody hear me? Does this microphone work? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for this very uh, kind introduction. And uh, I would like to try to lay the grounds a little bit for, for today's talk. So, I'm going to talk about a couple of really basic things, a uh, couple of things that we do know in principle, <coughs> but I want to try um, to make you think about them again in a bit more legalistic way. So we are talking about money today, the future of money, and I'm going to start by a look into the past of money. So I'm starting here. Basically, with this is an aureus uh, uh, of Augustus, which is about 2,000 years old, a gold coin. So that is a means of payment, that is money. So how, what's the intricacies of this system of um, using money? Um, the first thing is, uh, looking at it from a market practice uh, point of view, it is something uh, over which you have possession, and when you want to use it, you just deliver it. You de just deliver physical uh, possession. You give it from one person to the next person. What's the economic analysis of this? Where does, in particular, without going into uh, any details, where does, in particular, the value come from? So the value here, obviously, comes from the gold that's in the coin, though, as we know, that was already diluted in good old Roman times and probably also before in other cultures. So, in principle, it was the gold value, but that was even uh, diluted. Then, in terms of legal aspects, yeah, looking at it, and much of English law, also of civil law, is kind of still rooted in Roman law, so we can actually think they treated it that at the time the same way we would treat it today. So, how does it actually work? How does it change? How do we change title? How do you become the owner of that money? Well, like basically you become the owner of a bicycle. You know, it's, it's kind of handed over and with the handover of possession and agreement of the parties, you become the owner of that value. Very simple but interesting in the context of what we are going to look at a little later. So then we have modern money. This is, not, uh, this is a jump of about 2,000 years nearly. So what we are looking at here is an old US dollar note. And the interesting thing here is it says, in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. So that is the so-called kind of gold standards where banknotes could still be changed into gold at the central bank. Here, uh, obviously, it is very, very clear where the, where the val value comes from. The value comes from the fact that you can get the gold, and the gold is supposed to have some material value on which you can <laughs> build and on which you can uh, yeah, which you can build. Um, in terms of practicalities, it is not so much different from, um, the Roman, from the Roman gold coin. You hand it over yeah, and that passes the ownership over the money, uh, <coughs> the uh, economic and legal attribution of the money uh, to the other person. Where does this kind of money come from? It comes from the central bank. Uh, so there is also an element of trust. Yes, you, have, you, have the you have the interchangeability with gold, but that also presupposes trust in the central bank that they will actually do it. That brings us to modern, more modern money. Uh, that's a, it's a historic pound coin, not in circulation anymore, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but here, that was not that couldn't be changed into gold anymore. So it basically means you have the paper, you can't go to the Bank of England and get gold instead. So what is the difference here? Again, you become the owner of the note or through handing it over. Yeah. The practicalities are basically exactly the, exactly the same, but the question about the value is much more tricky because there's no underlying gold. So where does it come from? That's a pure question of trust. Basically, you trust the central bank, you tr trust their monetary policy, you, you trust that they keep a system afloat 
that makes sure that, do that you can exchange this node whenever you want for something reasonable, like, uh, like goods or services in particular. So that's the modern money. And now it gets more tricky. Uh, we are coming to something which is called in many jurisdictions scriptural money or you, we could also say commercial money or book money. This is created on the accounts of banks. And that is something really interesting because much of the money that is circulating uh, in our markets, I, I would suppose something about 90% or so, is actually not issued by the central banks. This is created by commercial banks, by private institutions. How does that work? So they, it, it detail is very complex, but it basically they take deposits. They lend, on ma lend out money on the basis of this deposit. People take these loans, the money circulates in the economy. People get it in their hands, they have it in their hands. What, they do, do, what do they do? They deposit it again. But through leverage, banks have the possibility to create lots of book money by this way. And that's uh, basically <coughs> circulating. So how does that work? That is now totally different. In terms of practicalities, you can't hand it over anymore when you're buying something. So you need an intermediary. You need a system that administers the whole thing. Otherwise, it doesn't work. That's one thing. Market practice is very different. The trust, again, you need a trust in your bank and you need probably also trust in your central bank and your government so that they keep the whole system afloat. Otherwise, this is just worthless. Yeah? These are just worthless kind of numbers in an account. And what does it legally mean in legal terms? So. Um, is that really still money? Well, yes, it is a form of money. These are basically claims against private market ac actors against the banks. So when you have money like this, in particular in your account with your bank, you have a claim against your bank, which is uh, very distinct from having a coin or a bill or even a gold coin in your hands. So that's a one form, a more modern form of money. Let's look at the exponentiation of this. This is a modern payment system. I'm grossly oversimplifying here. So let's think of a payment system or let's think of a credit card system uh, like Visa or let's even think of prepaid credit cards or prepaid money cards where you can charge a little kind of 50 pounds on your card. So you have a huge integrated system where even you have a central server, all the banks are connected, um, you have uh, businesses that process payments through PayPal and even you can pay, maybe pay in your bus with your card and it is somehow uh, connected to the system. So how does that work? Actually whenever you touch with your contactless, yeah, it looks like delivery, like handing over money, but it has nothing to do with it. Yeah? There's no delivery of any f anything physical, tangible, no. What it means, mean, it's we're just, this is a huge system of claims, yeah, of different intermediaries against one another. So what we do whenever we touch with our contactless card is we are changing somehow the relationship of claims between all these market participants. Again, this is something which without the system in place and working, I can't do anything. My contactless card, my pre-charged contactless card is totally worthless uh, when the system doesn't work. So where does it, the value come from? Again, trust in the people running this system and ultimately in our states. Now I come now to something which is kind of the elephant in the room and that's cryptocurrencies or virtual currencies like Bitcoin. Oh, how does that look like? You have here something which is decentralized. Well, actually, I don't like the term decentralized. I prefer the term distributed. It works a, bit, a little bit like the internet. Yeah, everybody is connected to everybody. They have a common uh, ledger, a common record of past transactions. And on the basis of this, uh, of this record, <coughs> you, can, um, you can define who owns what, who owns how many bitcoins. That's the very basic idea. This has a number of extremely interesting and distinctive features, which makes it very, very distinct from anything we have seen before. And I just, before we do that, before I come to this, let's think why this is so interesting. Of course, at the moment, 
uh, I suppose about three quarters of the, uh, the persons in this room are gambling with Bitcoin, kind of ho hoping that the price goes further up. That is fine. So that is one world. The other question is, beyond Bitcoin and the current state of Bitcoin, that might evolve. So Bitcoins might become a bit more integrated in our day-to-day -day, day -to -day life, may become even a real means of payment when you go to the grocery shop or something like this. Yeah? And then, that's one point. The second point is, we might kind of copy this system and use it for more traditional financial assets. For traditional money, maybe the money issued by the central bank, as I have explained before, or money issued by commercial banks. So we could have a, you know the term blockchain, yeah? The blockchain technology is at the basis of Bitcoin. We could take the blockchain technology and apply it to other areas, including payments, including money, including deposits and savings and everything. So, uh, that is five, another five minutes. Okay, thank you very much. That's a lot, actually. I thought I was going <laughs> already running out of time. So, what is so special? about this system. I brought you a slide which is very, very complex. Uh, what is so special about the Bitcoin and blockchain technology? So the first point is it's a distributed ledger. It means there are copies of identical, of the same ledger. There are identical copies everywhere. N there's no prevalent copy. They, all these copies around the world distributed, they have the same value. And everybody connects to everybody, a bit like the internet. What does it mean? Well, when everybody to it connects to everybody, that's quite distinct from what we have in the situation when we have a bank account, right? Because there we just connect to our bank. Whenever we want something, we talk to our bank, so kind of send money to our friends or so. So there are no, in the Bitcoin environment, because this, there is no relevant person more anymore for you, there are no accounts. So, so the accounts that we know nowadays they will disappear in a bit Bitcoin environment, or blockchain environment, I should say. Then, it's immutable, that means it cannot be changed afterwards. So once the transaction is done, it cannot, the transaction cannot be undone. What does it mean? Well, if errors happen just by kind of lapse, yeah, you, even then, it's very difficult to undo. Uh, then there's something like, which I call deep ledger, and that's an interesting thing. Deep ledger, me, by, by, by this I mean, that this new technology enables us to transfer more than just amounts like one and zero. Yeah? Kind of thousand pounds for a computer system is a very, very simple imp uh, information. What we can transfer here uh, is like little, little packages, yeah? capsules, in which you have different kinds of information packed toge packaged together and you transfer this as a whole. And in this package, you can even have little executable <coughs> programs which go with your financial assets. So it is a quite useful thing, and the banking industry likes it a lot because you can do everything on the basis of this one record. You don't need other records, like you have a share, and then you need a, a different record of how much dividend is going to be paid. No, it's everything is in concentrated in that one ledger, so there's no mismatches, and of course you don't need to employ that many people to look after your, the various places where you're storing data. Everything can be stored in such a deep ledger. Lastly, no, penultimate point. There is no authority in a Bitcoin network. That means no trust. <coughs> it all works on the basis of technology, or it's supposed to work exclusively on the basis of technology. There is some discussion about it. And then, automatic execution. Once you put uh, an op uh, a transaction into, uh, you give it a go, you push the button, yeah, there's no control. Off it goes and you can't get it back. So, what will the financial industry probably retain from this? And this is a very interesting point. We are always thinking in terms of blockchain and that is basically the Bitcoin blockchain. What will we use in our financial context when we talk about money issued by central banks and money issued by electronically issued by banks? What is really interesting for them 
from this blockchain concept. Actually, not everything. Banks and central banks, they want to retain control over the system. They do want to know who is participating. They do want to be able to correct errors. So they're not probably not going to retain the whole concept of blockchain like Bitcoin blockchain. They're basically interested in the distributed ledger because this is kind of the data is everywhere and everybody, everybody can have access. And they are in, in, uh, interested in the deep ledger uh, quality because that allows uh, them to work for whatever they are doing on the basis of the same ledger. Very last slide. What about efficiency and what about alternatives? So we are thinking about putting money now on the blockchain. Is that really the best idea? It's a cost return a consideration. And we know in implementation probably, yeah, scalability. Can we really run really big uh, blockchain networks? Policy concerns. What about privacy? If we share, if this ledger is really everywhere. What about competition? How can we do this in different jurisdictions? And lastly, well, if this is maybe very costly or too complicated, shall we maybe just keep the old system and clean it up and use some features of blockchain technology for our payments and our money? Thank you very much for your interest. That's it for myself. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak today. I'm very excited to be here. The future of cash um, is an exciting topic. You're all interested. All students are keen. And it's in the media a lot. Um, and I'm going to speak about three aspects of the topic, and they're on the board. And they're technology, trust, and complexity. So for the first three, I'm going to tell a story. And for the third one, I've got some slides. Let me start with my story. And the story is a story about my family. I've got two children, a daughter and a son. And the topic of money and what money and its value is a few years ago was a topic that came up. And it came up because my daughter is, a, is very keen. She's a very keen sort of student. She wants to understand the reasons why things are the way they are. And she spends her time studying and thinking about things. My son is interested in money. He wants to be rich when he's grown up. <laughs> and he's, like my daughter, very, very serious about this. And this um, went as far as when he was six years old, we had to develop a policy whereby we would work out what he, we, what he, would, what he would be paid for. So he would be paid for brushing the dog. He would be paid for cleaning the car. He was not paid for homework. And he was not paid for tidying his room, because especially tidying his room is what all people do, grown-ups and their children. And moreover, and very relevantly for this presentation, his focus was on coins. So he kept little stacks of gold coins, pound coins, silver coins, 50p, 20p, and 10p in his room. And he had a really nice time handling them and organizing them. And that gave him a lot of pleasure. And then one day he came home from school and he was very agitated. He said, this is a big problem because he found out that the coins weren't real. They were not really gold or really silver and he felt that he had been deceived. Um, that was a big problem, but he said not to worry. We can go to the Bank of England and exchange them. And he would please like to do that very soon <laughs> because he, he would have he would prefer the real thing. Now, at that point, I, of course, had to step up to the task and explain to him that this was possible once, but no longer is. And, and of course, at that point, my daughter chipped in, and she wanted to join the conversation. And then I spent quite a bit of time explaining to a nine and a six-year-old how money worked and what it was that gave it value. Now, connecting this to points about technology and trust, the first point I'd like to make here is a point that technology using it in a wide sense has always underpinned money. So 
So one aspect of it is fungibility, breaking up value into, into <coughs> units that can be used easily at an operational level to facilitate exchange. The second point I'd like to make about technology is a legal technological point, and Philip sort of connected to it, and that is negotiability. So paper money came about in the form of notes that allowed or were designed in a way that the delivery of certain assets, coins that were made of valuable gold or of valuable material, gold or silver, were delivered either when the no after the note had been endorsed to the person named on the note or to the bearer of the note. And that was a legal technology that was developed in the private space by merchant, by merchant, by merchants, by people who traded uh, goods. And that was a technology that the law had to look at and it took quite some time for it to take root and it took quite some time for it to be accepted by the law. So paper money in London goes back to what are called goldsmith notes and exchequer bills. And the goldsmith notes in particular, and very interestingly, were developed as a response to a drop in trust in the state. So what had happened was that merchants kept their gold in the tower and then um, the king, shortly before the Civil War, did what you know kings do. He forcibly borrowed that money and used it for his purposes. And that, and that caused then the merchants to stop storing their money in the tower, but they took it to the goldsmiths who issued notes. The law then had to work out what to do with it, and it really did take some time for it to settle, and the law ultimately, of course, accepted negotiability. So the money then, interestingly, transformed from a technique developed in the private space to a technique used by the state, by the government. Money became, issuing money became a monopoly of the Bank of England in 1844, and ultimately, we have to trust the state that, that, that they will ensure, that the government will ensure, the Bank of England will ensure that um, the value of money will continue to, to be preserved. So we are, we're sort of, we are, we are looking at trust now in the bank um, and, and that is something that was a development we saw in paper money and I don't think connecting it to the modern world, there's any reason why that same development shouldn't occur for electronic tokens. And there's also no reason that the law wouldn't cope with it. So that's a development that I don't think from a legal perspective, um, th there will be some reshuffling and there will be some questions on how this can be done. But I don't think that's, a, that's gonna be a sort of a, an overwhelm, a, a, a problem that's difficult to resolve. <coughs> okay, now let me move on to complexity, which is connected to, um, to sort of using electronic means. And, and there's, a, and there's a, a, a very big puzzle here. Um, and the puzzle that is connected to complexity has to do with the fact that on the one hand, what we have seen in fairly recent years is a transition to a world where connections have become a lot easier. So I remember a world where making a phone call, let alone an international call, cost real money. It was not cheap when I was a teenager to call my friend in the afternoon. That was a, diff a very expensive thing to do and there were limits on how much of my time I was allowed to spend on the telephone. That's all gone. <laughs> my daughter now, who is a teenager, can spend endless time connecting through her telephone voice over IP. It costs no money whatsoever. So it's very easy to make connections. Paradoxically, however, we have become increasingly disconnected with our assets. So the area of my research that I so that, that I do that most of my work on are the way securities are held. And they are a lot more important now than gold or silver. And what has happened there is the market infrastructure, perhaps precisely because it is so easy to connect, has become so complex that issuers and investors have become disconnected. And I'm gonna show two recent cases that were decided um, in, by the English courts fairly recently. So one case you can see here is a German investor, his name is Eckele, 
and he is invested in a UK company called Dinic Holdings. And the problem with his investment is that because of these intermediaries, he was unable in that case to exercise a remedy that would have helped him to comp get compensation for a loss he, he suffered as a result of a delisting. So Dinic Holdings delisted and he wanted to exercise his rights as a shareholder of that company, but he couldn't do it because the intermediaries that acted between him and Dinic Holdings, and you can see they're all very well known and regulated financial institutions, <coughs> didn't have the ability to connect him with the issuer. So that was a problem that he had, and that of course affected the value of his assets, and that's puzzling and slightly counterintuitive because you would think that with the ease of connections, this should not be a difficult problem. Another case which was decided in the Court of Appeal recently also concerns um, securities. This time those were bonds. And the issue was Credit Suisse. The investor was, uh, was a company called Secure Capital. And, and in that case, this was a, th those were allegations of mis-selling. So the Secure Capital felt that they had a cause to argue that they weren't given the information they were entitled to when the securities were sold to them. And they, they, they sued, um, and they weren't able to have standing, and the reason was also this chain of intermediaries that acted between them and the issuer. So we're, we're looking at complexity. We're also looking at a limitation of the law, and that is contract law. So we're looking at the problem that the contracts that operate here are always bilateral contracts. So it is not the case that secure capital as an investor would have a right against Clearstream Banking or against Bank of New York Mellon. They only have a right against the next person in the chain and that has an, a diluting effect on their rights. Now, similar lessons can actually be drawn from Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin, Philip said there weren't any accounts but there is something, and that is the vulnerable point, that, that is the, the private key. So when you lose your private key to your Bitcoin, that's it. That's like burning a banknote, because without that private key, you cannot access those coins. So the problem is keeping that safe. And here, the vulnerable point is the wallet. So maybe that's not an account, but it's very similar, because that is the way in which you hold your private key, and there's hosted and non-hosted wallets, and the unsafer of those, you can guess, are the hosted ones, because for those, you don't have a private key. The private key is stored for you. You cannot access it. You can only ask your wallet provider to access it, and then immediately, we're back to trust. We're immediately back to a point where we have to trust the wallet provider that they keep enough private keys to satisfy the promises they have made to all of their wallet customers. And of course, they're unregulated entities, and there is a problem there that we can never be sure, because regulated entities sometimes don't keep enough assets, notwithstanding client asset rules and notwithstanding the FCA um, sort of barking down there or sort of barking up their tree. There is a, there's a, so there's, there's a, a problem in, in the regulated space with shortfalls, and of course, there is a problem also in, in the Bitcoin environment. So as far as I know, um, the main blockchain has never been hacked. And that is an amazing achievement given the environment that that software serves. So we're, not, we're talking about a, a very challenging environment in which Bitcoin are used. That main blockchain, as far as I know, has never been hacked. But what has been attacked are the wallets and the exchanges that connect. And there, of course, is the risk that their security systems aren't effective. That, but there's also the risk that there is a sort of problem with integrity, that they make promises that they're not keeping. So, so we're finding the real problem is intermediation. The real problem isn't the computer system. The problem is having intermediaries and finding a way of generating trust or finding a way of, of making them trustworthy. Um, Another mechanism that you can see in the Bitcoin space increasingly emerging is moving transactions off the chain. 
So the providers you connect with no longer transfer the coins on the chain, they do that in their environment off the chain. And that, of course, again, introduces trust. Now, what is, is the takeaway here? Well, my, my view is it is really important to embrace technology. The world is moving in, in the technological space. That is something we, we will have, we should have. But it is, it is important to do this with caution. And it's important to keep in mind that the fa fact that a technology makes available direct <coughs> connectability does not necessarily, and of course not never necessarily, mean that whoever uses the technology will actually in fact use it in a way that includes connectability. So you need to look carefully at whichever implementation of the technology you're looking at. And then let me conclude by a very loyally point, the, the fact how connections are made and what the legal position of market participants is, and that includes us as retail individuals, is determined by contracts. And unfortunately, as always, the legal small print is important. And both Mr. Ekele and Secure Capital were in, a, were in the position that they were in, in a position where they were disconnected from their assets only because they accepted terms that authorized this form of outsourcing, that authorized this structure. This was purely a contractual problem. They accepted something that had this effect. So there, there's a possibility that they didn't quite know what they signed when they, when, they, when they signed the contract, but that was, as it turned out, their problem. So, so the takeaway is, of course, always read the small print, even when you buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the LSE Law Department for inviting me, a sociologist from another planet, uh, as you're about to discover, uh, to this event. Before I go on, I'd like to enter uh, some caveats. I'm often sued when I talk about Bitcoin and gold, so, uh, but I'm in a lawyer's convention, so surely that's not going to happen. Um, Bitcoin is one of a wide and diverse range of cryptocurrencies. 1,322 are currently listed on coinmarketcap.com. Those who use Bitcoin are not a homogenous group. Some of the most useful and exciting features of the blockchain technology that underpins Bitcoin are not about money at all, but have other uh, uses in fields such as law. Bitcoin itself is money in a somewhat limited way because it is most widely used as a financial asset, as we see with the price today, not as a means of payment. Uh, then a note of caution about me. Um, as a sociologist of money, uh, for a long, long time now, it's a curse. I'm interested in the social underpinnings of Bitcoin and similar cryptocurrencies and in technical questions only insofar as they have social consequences. So I won't be talking about the forking debates or about many of the other arcane questions that Bitcoin geeks like to discuss. And I won't be offering predictions about the current price spike sell, nor about the prospects for Bitcoin cash. Finally, although I have plenty of critical things to say about the discourse around Bitcoin, I'm not a hater. I have thoroughly enjoyed watching Bitcoin prove a lot of people wrong so far, and long may this continue. <laughs> I have 15 minutes. I will make 15 points. I'll start with some fast headline points, and then I will try to develop an argument. Point one, Bitcoin 
is a techno-utopia. It seems futuristic, a techno-utopia or dystopia, of course, without politics and inefficient or corrupt institutions or their irrational and flawed decisions. Above all, many Bitcoiners associate the currency with the betterment of society. At stake here are four very seductive ideas. First, the Bitcoin network is decentered and flat, with no hierarchy, no single point of authority, and above all, no state. Second, Bitcoin offers reliable technological solutions to key problems of monetary governance, such as inflation. Third, Bitcoin dispenses with the need to trust others, whether they are experts, politicians, or ordinary people. And fourth, Bitcoin is debt-free money just like gold. But as I hope will become clear, the first three of these claims are probably wrong, and I fail to see what's so great about the fourth. Point two, Bitcoin is backward looking. For all of its utopian properties, Bitcoin is much closer to the past of money as an ideology, as a theory, and as a philosophy. It is a throwback, a regressive step, almost a relic. You will see this case being made in what follows. And of course, I'm trying to be provocative. <laughs> Point three, Bitcoin relies on a flawed theory of money. It treats money as a thing whose supply must be controlled in order for it to have value rather than as a social process. It also treats money as apolitical, and there is a fundamental contradiction there. Because, point four, Bitcoin has politics. While its advocates emphasize the absence of hierarchy and authority and the presence of distributed decision-making, in practice, the currency is characterized by a strikingly high degree of political hierarchy and social organization. Technology cannot enact social organization on its own. As a form of money, Bitcoin has been sustained by sociological characteristics such as structure, leadership, hierarchy, trust, friendship, and community much more than it has evaded them. This is surely no surprise to a sociologist such as me. My point is simply that the social reality of Bitcoin is at odds with the theory behind it. A system that originally appealed because of distributed qualities is in some ways rather centralized, which takes me to point five. Bitcoin has a social structure with its own specific social inequalities. This is partly about wealth concentration, Bitcoin's 1% and partly about mining. Bitcoin production is dominated by a very small number of mining pools. Indeed, the software favors the most powerful producers and incentivizes monopolistic practices. Point six, Bitcoin is gendered. Over 90% of Bitcoin users are male, although the number of female users is definitely rising. This is not simply about the raw number. As a social space, Bitcoin is heavily gendered. Women are often abused and intimidated. And a heavily sexist, anti-feminist rhetoric that tends to go unchallenged is not difficult to find on Bitcoin forums and other public platforms. We can just discuss why this happens, but at the very least it demonstrates again that as a social space, Bitcoin is highly exclusionary. Point seven, Bitcoiners are often but not always libertarian. In practice, you can find Bitcoiners right across the political spectrum, although more of them self-identify as libertarian or anarchist than anything else. What matters more, I think, is that Bitcoiners very often do have political reasons for supporting Bitcoin. Yes, they tend to be libertarian to right wing, and anti-state, but intriguingly, they are also often anti-bank and financial establishment in their political views. Point eight, while Bitcoin is anti-social, Bitcoiners are social. 
Going by its design, Bitcoin does indeed seem antisocial. The emphasis on a currency without trust, the reliance on technology rather than social organization, and yet in practice, Bitcoiners do communicate a lot. There are countless meetings and conventions and a very active Reddit. So I would say that while Bitcoin is, as a design is inherently antisocial, I would not extend this to those who use it. Bitcoin may be a virtual currency whose production is carried out by a computer network, but those who use it often express quite a strong sense of collective identity, far stronger, one might say, than one finds in the case of mainstream currency. Point nine, Bitcoin is primarily a financial asset and a highly successful one. Is it Ponzi-esque? Bitcoin itself seems too old now to make this case, although there have been other several, several other similar currencies that do look a little bit Ponzi. But even though the price continues rising, there are obviously some serious problems connected with the exchanges, security, scaling, and energy use, which nobody has mentioned yet. I'm in favor of the polar bears. Point 10, as money, Bitcoin sucks. I guess this is the heart of what I need to say today. For a start, it is hyper deflationary, and nobody wants to use a currency, surely, whose value either fluctuates wildly, as Bitcoin sometimes does, or rises inexorably. Bitcoin can still, of course, be used with another unit of account like the dollar, but this begs the question, which I guess we'll all want to talk about, why use Bitcoin as money at all? Point 11, Bitcoin has parallels with gold and appeals to many users as a return to fundamental value, albeit in digital form. While the comparison between Bitcoin and gold often focuses solely on price, there are some deeper connections. Like gold, Bitcoin supply is finite. I also think there may be a deeper yearning within Bitcoin or the Bitcoin community for more profound and stable forms of value in an era when value itself seems to have lost any anchorage in reality. The 2008 crisis was a crisis of fictitious capital, and paradoxically, Bitcoin appeals to some of its users as an antidote to this. Digital gold, only an improvement on gold, whose production is controlled by machines. Point 12, Bitcoin is memory. Viewed solely as a distributed ledger that is effectively just a database, blockchain technology encourages another epistemological utopianism that goes beyond money. Contrary to the infinitely copyable world of plenty we associate with digital media, the blockchain makes finitude and singularity possible. From the idea that money is a thing whose production can be regulated and controlled through the notion that each of our actions or transactions, our votes, buying property, medical vaccinations, getting married, receiving a degree, is a uniquely verifiable event. I am on the blockchain, therefore I exist. <laughs> I am on the black blockchain, therefore I am unique. I am on the blockchain, therefore, for lawyers this one, I am beyond contestation. This may help to explain why, point 13, Bitcoin is cultish. Blockchain technology tends to be supported with a quasi-religious zeal. I'm sure we'll see one or two questions which demonstrate that. The blockchain appeals not only because it can remember every discrete event within the network, but crucially because its memory is infallible. The blockchain, or is held to be infallible, the blockchain seems to promise a world of absolute certainty, God-like guarantees, but no God. Perhaps Bitcoin offers existential security during a post value post-truth era. The conversation around Bitcoin is peppered with biblical language, references to Old Testament versions of the Bitcoin design. Roger Ver's nickname is Bitcoin Jesus. Comparisons between different protocols and the Tower 
of Babel, and we know how that ended. And of course, Bitcoin's so-called founder, Satoshi Nakamoto, is often referred to as the Bitcoin Messiah. The latter story came to a head last year when a man called Craig Wright made a serious claim supported by a serious PR machine that he was Satoshi. This was merely one of a series of stories claiming to have discovered who the real Satoshi is. Craig, it turned out, was not the Messiah, but just a very naughty boy. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Oh, just <laughs> Python fans are here in force. What interests me is why it even matters. Why a form of money that advertises itself as above politics, above people, above trust, and above organisations seems to be so deeply embroiled in its own origin story. As I said earlier, Bitcoin is as much about looking backwards as about looking forwards. Point 14. Bitcoin can be part of a diverse monetary ecology. Bitcoin is both a symptom of increasing monetary pluralism in the advanced capitalist societies and an embodiment of monetary diversity in its own right. Neither Bitcoin nor any other cryptocurrency will ever be our only form of money. What we are seeing now is the opposite tendency towards monetary pluralism. The range of monies we regularly use is increasing. I think this is positive. We can choose which forms of money we want to use according to convenience, taste, necessity, or ideology. There are issues here, of course, when there are just too many forms of money. Money works best when we don't really have to think about it. But what I also see here is a more worrying trend, wherein there are closer connections between our money and our identity, between what we use money for and privately owned data. Money is becoming a very powerful tool of surveillance. And because so many of us seem either ignorant of this or uncaring, I would like to see this acknowledged more openly and debated more rigorously. Who has access to our payments card data? And should this data be sold? Moreover, our formal legal identity as citizens is increasingly being anchored in our status as financial subjects. Slide, 20, um, slide 27, yes, but point 15. <laughs> and you'll all be thrilled to know my final point. What I've just said might be taken as an argument in favor of Bitcoin, and perhaps it is. But this brings me to point 15. Bitcoin will not destroy cash. Nothing will. If Bitcoin offers an opportunity to use money outside of the massive apparatus of finance, finance and state surveillance, this is surely a good thing. But Bitcoin performs poorly as a means of payment, so this really would be a better argument for cash. And I would like to end with this. We are increasingly seeing confident predictions about the end of cash in some countries, such as Sweden and South Korea. This process is well underway, but pause before celebrating. Cash tends to be used disproportionately by the poorest members of society, many of whom aren't very appealing to banks unless they can be charged extortionate borrowing fees. Should we be obliged to embroil ourselves in the banking system in order to be able to function in a practical sense in society. Indeed, in order to be able to exist as citizens in society. Debates about the future of money should not simply focus on questions of efficiency and convenience and regulation, but on the values and ideals that we associate with money. This is why I don't really see the future of money as defined by Bitcoin, which not only replicates but exacerbates the self-same inequities of wealth and power that can be found in the existing financial system. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general are part of a diverse future 
of money, a pluralistic monetary system where Bitcoin is used alongside cash, payments cards, local and community currencies, is likely to be more resilient, more open, and more democratic. Thank you very much. For this. This should, I think, segue quite nicely from what Nigel's been talking about. Um, I want to talk first a little bit about Bitcoin before I talk about the future of money more generally. And I should say that this is quite personal for me, and it's funny someone should have mentioned losing private keys, because I bought 0.13 Bitcoin in 2014 um, for about four pounds. It's now worth around about 900 pounds, and guess what? I don't have my private key. <laughs> so there you go, a lesson to everyone. Um, so I want to take a bit of a step back and talk a little bit about how Bitcoin works. Now, um, we, understanding it is, is actually reasonably easy, right? We could use physical notes and coins and, and, and you know, that would be pretty inconvenient, particularly if we wanted to make transactions across a long distance. We need digital money for distance, right? Um, but digital money comes with its own problems. If you have a digital file on your computer that represents a one pound coin, um, then that creates the opportunity for you to simply replicate that file. What is to stop you from spending your one pound coin, your digital pound coin, um, twice? So we tend to solve this problem with what the Bitcoin community calls trusted third parties, trusted central authorities, banks. We trust that banks will maintain their ledgers and will tell us, will tell us in a trusted way when money has moved from one place to another. Bitcoin purports to solve that double spend problem, but at the same time to take out these trusted third parties, these intermediaries. Um, does it? Does it achieve that purpose? So the easiest way I can think of to understand this is by reference to an analogy that you guys should all understand, and that's Uber. So you'll all know how Uber works, and recently Uber introduced a new platform called Uber Rush. And Uber Rush connects couriers with individuals and with businesses. Now I don't have any slides, but um, I do have some padlocks that might help me to explain this. So suppose I want to send some gold to Nigel. I'm gonna put some gold in a box, I'm gonna lock that box, and I'm gonna send it by courier to Nigel. What Nigel's going to do is add his padlock to that box, send it back. I'm at that point going to take my padlock off, send Nigel's padlock back on the box, and he can unlock it at that point, knowing that no one has interfered with that box, knowing that no one could at any point have accessed the gold, because always either my padlock was on it or he, his was. So we know that the courier hasn't in, intervened in any way. And Nigel, at that point, announces to the whole system that he now has the gold that I previously owned. Now, that is exactly how Bitcoin works. Bitcoin uses public key cryptography, which is just a variation on this padlock thing. And it does that to make sure that no one has intervened at any point with the transactions that are sent. And in terms of verifying those transactions, th that process is conducted by miners in exactly the same way in which driving responsibility is farmed out to drivers on the Uber platform. It is exactly the same. And why have I done this? Why have I used this padlock example and why have I used Uber? Simply to show you that when we say things like, oh, Bitcoin is a disintermediated system, there are no trusted third parties, all of that is false, right? Bitcoin itself is an intermediary. Bitcoin itself is an intermediary. And so when we analyze it, when we think about it, we need to analyze it on those terms. Is it a successful intermediary? And it's really weird, it turns out. It has no constitution whatsoever, whether that's a political constitution or a corporate constitution. There is, of course, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, which if you haven't read and you're interested in this stuff, do go and read. But that 
white paper is less of a kind of normative framework for decision making and more of a IKEA flat pack instructions for the digital realm, right? It's just how do things work? Rather than a board of directors, there's the core coding group. Now that core coding group who determine the future of Bitcoin are not elected, they're not employed by the system, but nor are they entirely independent of it. They tend to be sponsored by either the MIT Digital Currency Initiative or the Bitcoin Foundation. There are no consensus mechanisms for internal dispute resolution. So whatever the core coders want to do, if they all disagree with one another, then that's it. What they can do simply is to announce their intention to make a particular upgrade to the code to Reddit, to these fora on Reddit. People debate and discuss in heavily censored, heavily mediated discussions. And then the ultimate direction of the code is determined by the miners themselves. And these miners work a little bit like uh, shareholders. They have voting responsibility in that they can lend their <coughs> computational power to a particular version of the code, the one that they like. The other thing that makes them, I guess, similar, like share, similar to shareholders is that they also receive a token that is in some way attached to the value of the network, and that is the Bitcoin that they receive in return for verifying transactions. But when, when you see things that bloggers have written which say, oh, oh, you know, Bitcoin is like a political system, in particular that there's an analogy drawn with the US political system, um, I, I don't think that analogy gets you very far, because unlike a territorial democracy, the users you and I who might buy and sell Bitcoin have absolutely no say in the direction of the network whatsoever. That decision making is at the coding level and at the minor level. It's more like a corporate platform. But here's the difference. Uber has rigorous decision making processes, right? At a board level, those decision making processes are operate within set parameters and in, in incredibly rigorous ways. And it, Bitcoin has nothing like that. So as a platform, as a company, it's a really bad one. And, what, and how is that manifested? Well, first up, there's an incredible glut of transactions. Now, if you want to get a transaction through the Bitcoin network and you want to do it quickly, um, you will need to attach a transaction fee. So imagine that you're standing in the rain waiting for your Uber, and the only way it's going to get there in the next hour is if you pay the driver an additional 50 pounds to get there. That's exactly how Bitcoin works now. <laughs> um, and the other part of that is, as um, Nigel mentioned, Bitcoin Cash has now um, become a competitor to Bitcoin. It really has. Um, and the reason for that is that the miners got so fed up with the Bitcoin core coding group not taking any action on this problem, this um, slowing of transactions, that they simply just took it into their own hands to develop an alternative. And that alternative is Bitcoin Cash. And if you take nothing away from Bitcoin Cash, it, it should simply represent a failure of the consensus mechanisms built into Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, I guess I want to tell you, is Uber's poor cousin. That's how I see it. <laughs> But it can teach us some things about the future of money, um, and, and some that are closer to my own research and some that are further away. Um, first up, up it, it, the Bitcoins themselves are interesting, right? They are a unique digital asset, and that's something that we don't see that often. It takes information and it turns it into a unique digital asset. Um, and I'm interested in the role of the state in supporting the appearance of ownership that that gives an individual. If I say I own a Bitcoin, how true is that, right? If someone comes along and tries to take it away from me, interferes in some way with my wallet, can I invoke the mechanisms of the state, in particular the legal system, to say, you who have interfered with my wallet, um, you are a wrongdoer? If not, if we need to turn to the consensus mechanisms internal to the system, um, and this is something that Philip's written a little bit about, then those consensus mechanisms need to be really robust. And they're not, right? In, a, in an analogous system, which is the Ethereum system that some of you might have heard of, there was not so long ago something called the DAO heist. And a group of individuals set up something which was um, supposed to operate as a digital 
or a decentralized autonomous organization on the Ethereum platform. And this was a decentralized investment fund. And they put tons of digital currency into that fund on this Ethereum platform. And the first thing that happened is someone came along and stole a bunch of that money. Now, the hacker did something quite smart. He said, hang on a minute. I, I haven't stolen your money, right? All I've done is operate within the rules of the system. That's exactly what hacking is. If you want to tell me that code is law, all I have done is exploit the mistakes that you wrote into your code. That's exactly hacking. So he said, I've, I've done nothing in any way wrong. The rest of the community, the Ethereum community, said, hang on a minute. When we said code is law, we, we didn't really mean code is law. There must be something else going on. There must be some normative significance to this statement that you own Ether, that you own a digital coin. And so what they did is banded together and rewrote the transaction history. So it was as if that had never happened. So this is only to say that you cannot, and this is Nigel's point, right? However far away from the state institutions you purport to get, you cannot get away from these political, normative, sociological decisions. <coughs> the second interesting point is kind of the flip side of the first, which is as we move from a world in which there's um, physical assets that are bought and sold and we can make these predictions about price, supply and demand, we need, as we move into a world where it, it's really an information economy and information itself is not scarce, we have seen already that different models for generating value have emerged. One of those models is Facebook. Now, Facebook purports to sell something to us um, and provide it to us, in a sense, for free, right? We have access to this network and lots of our friends are using this network and it looks like it's free. But it isn't free, right? It comes at a cost. And that cost is the use of your personal data to make informed decisions about your spending habits, your viewing habits, and therefore to target advertising more effectively. So Bitcoin, I think, raises interesting questions about whether or not we want aspects of that transaction to be secret, to be hidden. How much control do we want over our data in the future, and what kind of control do we want? As we move from a world in which it's, it's more physical commerce to indelible transacting, what does that control mean? And in answering that, I think we must do two things. One is to separate raw data from processed data. So sure, maybe we would be happy for the data concerning the way in which we transact and operate with one another to be sold, particularly if that is only metadata. Maybe we would accept that. If in return, these platforms are offering us, and blockchain provides one mechanism for doing this, if they were offering us a way of linking our creative contributions online to our outputs, and therefore monetizing the activity that we perform on Instagram, on Facebook, and all the other digital platforms that we spend a lot of our time on. And the other, and this again is a, a point that Nigel has already raised, is we need to think about the social impact of this stuff, and we need to do that without a middle-class hat on, right? Um, Kate Summers is doing some really interesting work in the social policy department on the earmarking practices that individuals in receipt of benefits engage in, in order to maintain control over their own resources. One uh, project involving the blockchain um, enables a way of sort of replicating these processes of earmarking in the digital sphere, but at the same time raises the specter that with things like benefits, you will not only have in, in complete government oversight of your spending activities, but also complete predetermination of the way in which you use money. So if in the U US there are food tokens being used to make sure that you can only spend the money that you have in particular ways, then the blockchain enables replication of that process in the digital sphere. And how comfortable are you with that, more, more or less, um, depending on the kinds of values that you hold? So this is simply to say that the future of money, identity, and social status are, I think, ever more closely intertwined. Um, lastly, and this is, I guess, to challenge a couple of the things that have been said so far, um, Bitcoin has been presented as something of a panacea, not by these guys, but by other people. 
And I want to steer away from universal conclusions. When we talk about things like the proliferation of currencies, um, can we really make that statement as a sort of, this is the way that we will be transacting in the round? It seems to me pretty obvious that the more that we transact in virtual goods and the more behavior that we adopt in the virtual sphere, um, that behavior, I think, will be governed by an increasing proliferation of virtual currencies. Um, that has its own consequences. If, if there is a greater opportunity for degrees of informal work carried out in the virtual sphere, and if that work can be monetized, can be paid for in opaque currencies that are, in, are internal to non-state networks, then perhaps that raises a challenge to some aspect of the existing tax base. But for real world goods, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't, I don't think we will see a shift away from large corporate or state entities. Quite the opposite. I think that d d data aggregation, if anything, enables new opportunities, not, not fewer opportunities, for increasingly monopolistic decision making. <coughs> the consequences are, one, increasing metrics that en enable us to um, determine the individual user to compete on a price level and potentially to offer personalized pricing might well offer us cheaper goods. But, and I guess this is the $10,000 question, um, at what socioeconomic cost? Fantastic. Thank you very much to all our speakers. We've got time for some Q&A. That was a sort of uh, challenge thrown down by ser certain of the speakers. So there, are, there will be stewards who are in the audience with microphones. If I do indicate that we'll take your question, please wait for the microphone to come to you. Please also bear in, bearing in mind the size of the audience, if you could keep your question relatively concise and uh, present it as a question rather than a statement. Also, I may take a couple of questions and bundle them for our panel. Thank you. So, I'd like to open the floor, please. Okay, the uh, person at the back, just on, no, behind oh, you. No. Yep. Sorry, thank you. And if you, sorry to interrupt before, if you could introduce yourself and if you wish, give us your affiliation as well. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah, I'm just a member of the public, no affiliation, uh, my name's Nico. Um, just interesting to know when you decentralize currencies, do you decentralize moralities as well? And um, I, I mean, w uh, the, the, the way that I see it is that morality has kind of um, been commercialized for as long as we can remember. And, and does cryptocurrency represent the beginning of an age where we no longer commercialize or commodify a morality or human nature? Thank you. So we will take another question, if we may. Uh, the person on the back row, please. Uh, hi, I just have a very quick question because in the panel you guys were talking about um, the value of money and so on and so forth. So I'm just a bit curious, um, how is the valuation of Bitcoin between its market price and its real value different? Because it seems that right now how we value Bitcoin is just basically based on demand. Thank you. And a third question, maybe the person here on the third row. Hi, uh, Dr. Kutz, this might be a very stupid question, but in your interesting analogy of the boxes of the padlocks, how does Nigel know what is in the box you sent him in the first place if your padlock is on it at that stage? Thank you. Thank you. So we were asked about decentralization of currency uh, and the relationship to decentralization of morality. How's the valuation of market and real valuation relative to one another? And how does Nigel know what's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> does Nigel care what's in the box? Hand this over to our panel. <laughs> <laughs> morality. Oh, morality. Um, yeah, morality is a great question. Um, yes and no. Um, I, 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 I mean, I think my point is that Bitcoin does have a morality, and I think a, a lot of people I've spoken to about Bitcoin that use it. Um, even the kind of Bitcoin hardcore, a very moral uh, set of reasons for 
what they're doing. So and I've got every respect for that. And um, it's probably got more morality than the euro or something. Um, <laughs> people think a lot more about it. I mean, I, I like currency um, nutters, as Keith Hart calls them, because th th they do think, I mean, so, I, you know, I, I have as much fun talking to people that promote the Brixton pound, the, the Bristol pound, as I do Bitcoiners and the Ethereum people, though they're all, uh, I, but, but generally, they do have a moral, uh, but I don't think there's a singular morality. I think that would be the difference, but I think it's a, a great way of thinking about this. On valuation. Philip, is that something that you wanted to say? Um, yes, I, since the question was asked, I'm thinking about what's the real value of Bitcoin, actually. Um, so it's, I, I think it ties in with what, what uh, Nigel said earlier. It's not really used as a means of payment. So the real value is uh, maybe determined. You should see it as being determined by what you can get for your Bitcoin. Yeah? And... Well, because there is not that much at the moment that you can get for the Bitcoin, that is, the market is relatively small. That is in itself very, very volatile. But I think at the moment, it b basically, it, it coincides with the speculative value of, of Bitcoin, um, though you might have a big disparity in times of stress, like in times of when the, when the bubble bursts, on times of financial crisis, whether you get anything for it, I don't think it's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So it may fall apart, but at the moment it's probably the same. Thank you. And Tatiana, maybe the last question. How does Nigel know what's... Um, <laughs> if, if, if the question is really how does the, the Bitcoin network work, um, then the answer is that that transaction is announced to the network in advance. <laughs> so I'd be sort of shouting to Nigel across the road that, Nigel, I'm sending you some gold, and that's the sort of Bitcoin equivalent of that. Oh, I wanted to say something about the morality quickly, which is that like, I, I just think, and I suppose this was the point that I was trying to make, that Bitcoin would be much more successful and perhaps much more coherent if that morality had been set out in advance more clearly with clearer normative guidelines to how it was to be implemented. Thank you. Uh, check the person in the front row, please. Kavita Kopas, um, no affiliation. Um, I'm trying to get my head around Bitcoin because I don't understand it. Um, and the nearest analogy I can find is the um, introduction of mobile phone technology and disconnecting communications from a physical landline and therefore a physical identity. Um, will Bitcoin eventually um, face the same problems that we face with mobile phone communications and that you don't really know who you're communicating with and it's very difficult to track what happens. And if somebody steals your mobile phone, they essentially have access to your um, to free communications um, and you can't trace those back to a physical location um, within a sort of a, a legal boundary, a, le a legal geographical boundary. And just my other very quick question for um, Philip was, What's the difference, what's the distinction you make between distributed and decentralized, which is something you alluded to at the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first over here. Hello, my name is Diana. I'm an A-level student writing a PQ on cryptocurrencies. So I wonder if anyone on the panel can comment on similarities of their opinions related to cryptocurrencies. That Western governments and non-Western governments, particularly I'm interested in Russia, actually, uh, have. So, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Francesco. I'm uh, doing a Master of, uh, of Political Economy. I have a quick question about... Uh, I, first of all, I really enjoyed the Dodd Professor Dodd presentation. It was really nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one thing you... Uh, I think you understand, you said it's, uh, Bitcoin is mainly an asset. Now, I'm pretty sure there is actually a real economy behind Bitcoin. It's mainly located in the dark web. Mm -hmm. So it's something that hasn't, I mean, hasn't been mentioned at all during this conference. Would, I, would, I mean, I would like to know, um, what is your thought about it? About the dark web. Okay, let's, let's stop there if we may. So the first question we had was about the historical analogy, maybe Ava, with um, 
mobile phones and uh, virtual, virtual currencies, with the follow-up which was directed at Philip about the distinction between distributed and decentralized. Uh, well, well, yes, in the sense that if you if you lose your private key, your coins are gone. So, so there is a sort of there's an an analogy there. Um, to be honest, I didn't quite understand the analogy with with the mobile phones in the sense that you've got you've got some token, which is not, and, and the phone would be a technology to access something. So I think, as a means of communication. Um, phones really aren't recording systems. They are sort of ways of accessing your, record, your records, and you can do that through a landline by telephone banking or through an app um, on, on a mobile phone. So I think I'm not sure the analogy works too well. Actually, um, second question. I'm prepared. I, I have a reserved slide on this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not by prior arrangement. Uh, network, network questions. So this is, um, I have redesigned this because it's <coughs> stolen from a US colleague and it's, uh, uh, these are diagrams from the 60s already. This is about communication networks. Yeah, so Bitcoin is a communication network or database as Martin said earlier, for records is just, but how do we share information uh, in a situation where we all want to have uh, access to, to, to that information? So you have a centralized network, think of a land register. Yeah. So there's one point uh, in a country where all the land transactions are recorded and if you want information, either you're directly connected through to a computer terminal or you just call them or you write a letter or whatever. Then, and that is hope, hopefully answering your question, that is a decentralized network. That's the one at the right hand side. And the char characteristic is the following. You have one central point, but this central point does not have all the information. The central point also only connects to uh, sub to a second second level or to a second layer of uh, registers of information sharing points and they know what comes behind so kind of you have the central spider which connects to other spiders yeah but the central spider doesn't really know to whom the other spiders are connected and doesn't have the data so that is very practical if you have long distances for example and this is why we have the, se the system basically everywhere in our financial markets uh, but obviously the big problem is you can have mismatches between the various registers. So it's very efficient, but it's very error prone. Now we come to Bitcoin, blockchain, and the distributed network. That's the one on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, think of a distributed network like basically like the internet. Everybody connects to everybody, communicates with everybody, and in that case, everybody has a copy of the record and none of these copies is the master copy and the others are the slave copies no they are all master copies they have all the same constitutive value that is a distributed record and now because i'm talking i'm just explaining what the beautiful thing at the right hand side is that is the phenomenon eva was talking about earlier because we have the bitcoin distributed network yeah that's the one on the left hand side these are the nodes yeah the, the nodes running the Bitcoin blockchain system. And then you have people connecting through these nodes. Uh, for example, a, a wallet or a Bitcoin exchange could be one of these nodes. But these people have just a relationship with the service provider. And this is why, why Eva said, and I totally agree with this, actually you have a layer of intermediation even in Bitcoin. So we have three systems, centralized, decentralized, distributed, and a combination distributed with uh, decentralized. And, this, and the uh, third and fourth questions related to Russia, uh, by the example, and the dark web. I, I got Russia. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I don't want to talk about Russia, actually, in particular, Can but... Can you swallow the dark web? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Um, it, in, I, I'm not sure I entirely understood the question as it was put, but... Um, in terms of the way in which Bitcoin or a similar system might be used or appreciated in a society in which people were more or less trusting of their central authority, I guess this is the, the sort of use case for Bitcoin. I see absolutely no economic, 
social or other gain to the Bitcoin network unless you don't trust your banks and, or you don't trust your state. Um, and there are examples of countries in which the blockchain has been used as a viable alternative to a state infrastructure for things like identity, um, and Estonia is an example of that. I'm not answering about the dark web, but I'll say something about um, the Silk, Silk Road, which is just that um, in terms of the future of cash, cash transactions by far outstrip the use of Bitcoin on the Silk Road for things like drugs, guns, um, and the, all of the other nefarious activities you can engage in on the Silk Road. Unless any, does anybody want to add anything on the dark web? Or you can take I don't know what more. the dark web okay. is. Okay, let's take, <laughs> let's take two final no, questions, if I may. The person in the middle, please. It's not allowed to know. Um, my name is Dinsdale Broderick, and um, I'm actually uh, here as part of a, a Swiss-based uh, hedge fund that actually uh, trades Bitcoin, and we're... Uh, actually uh, implementing uh, uh, an, ex uh, uh, an exchange as well, so I I'm a bit dangerous. Um, what I wanted to, to ask was um, the issue of central banks and quantum computing. It's something that uh, people have sort of brushed over. Um, the quantum computing issue has not been touched on at all. The fact that um, the blockchain could actually be cracked and if you look at what central banks such as the Fed are saying, that digital uh, technology, digital currencies, actually form part of the next generation solution. So what does the panel feel uh, legally should be happening in countries and in various organizations to make sure that uh, trust and the, the legal aspects are actually uh, beneficial to the individual and to companies and not to uh, concentrated groups such as central banks. Okay, one more question. Uh, person in the middle. Person right in the middle, please. And if I can, when the panel responds, I can keep it to 140 characters or fewer. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elena. I'm from Warwick, reading law. So I have a uh, a question regarding um, intellectual property law. And you mentioned Craig Wright, who claimed to be Nakamoto, and then he also uh, tried to patent like over 70 patents regarding blockchain. And I'm interested in the patentability criteria and issues that, for example, um, organizations seeking patents and then basically patent trolls and rent seeking and how that could impact the hindering innovation. And Thank you for those fantastic questions. Uh, panel, the central bank uh, role and quantum computing uh, and patents and I guess the IP dimension. Well, well I can do quantum computing um, and that's because I've asked a colleague of mine who is a computer scientist and I asked him that and he said that's not a problem because the blockchain will then be run on a quantum computer. So there's a transitional issue which he accepted but otherwise he wasn't worried. Um. <laughs> but we, we should potentially be worried about the concentration of power aspect, right? Before, it's possible to launch an attack on the Bitcoin system if 51% of the computational power in the network is concentrated in the same hands. And it has been. Yeah. It was two years ago. Yep. Um, so the system is just not as resistant as it would seem. IP patents? IP and patents? IP and patents, perhaps. No, you're right about Craig Wright, though. He did. For another, perhaps for another day. <laughs> I've got an eye on time. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to say thank you for your fantastic questions. Thank you for your participation. And to thank you.